Deus. Someone's getting their lawn mode. Well, it is six o'clock, and I know that we have a couple of folks unable to join us this evening. Um, Stephanie Risky is camping, and I hope she's having a wonderful time this evening. And Dr. Gettards is unable to join us. So um, we are again recording so that those that aren't able to be with us can, can catch up to us as they're able. Um, I don't believe we have anybody new on this evening's call, but let's just double check if there are any new members joining us this evening. Super, I did not think so, but just wanted to make sure. So again, the group is working on uh, helping me put together a PowerPoint slideshow that the board will approve at their next regular meeting, which is coming up later this month, um, Monday the 27th. Um, so that is our goal. We're working toward the high level plan. And we realize behind each one of these slides that we're putting together are probably pages and pages of detailed notes about how each department, whether it's food service or transportation, are going to implement all of these things. But um, this will be a way for us to get the word out into our community. Um, so we'll do a quick whip around before we turn this over to Nurse Jackie. Um, what are you hearing out in the community? Uh, what are you hearing from your colleagues that we need to pay attention to? Anyone go ahead and just jump right in. I've... Um talked to someone this past week that was concerned about students not wearing masks. She just thought that for staff, you know, kids come sick all the time and that was going to expose her and that was her concern. And uh, I'll have um, Jed probably talk about that in a little while about um, what he's hearing just um, in his world about students wearing masks. Thank you on that one. I'm currently being quarantined because somebody tested positive that I worked with at the county in Portage County. And so even though she had no symptoms, I have no symptoms. No, you know, you have to stay home, which if that were to happen at school, you know, everybody would then be quarantined that was in that classroom. Um, we can have Jed speak to that too, but that isn't necessarily what we're hearing. If, if we're asymptomatic, that is. But we'll have to talk about that. Stacy, it looks like you wanted to comment. Yeah, I've been hearing from um, parents that they really are adamant that their child does not wear masks and they refuse to send their kids to the school if that is going to be a requirement. So I was hearing that over the weekend myself. I've heard that as well. Um, and that came back in our, our parent survey as well that they would open and roll. I'm not sure where they go because um, I know at least everybody in the county um, is looking at staying consistent with our practices to the best of our ability. Um, and we talk to people statewide too. So we're, we're all trying to use the same best practice that we're learning about. Other, other things you're hearing or seeing? Uh, this is Brian. A lot that I've heard from um, a lot of teachers, not within our district, but just in the state, um, that are kind of nearing 
uh, a lot of the apprehension about going back to school. Um, a lot of them are in larger areas. Um, they are talking like they're not going to go back, um, but just wanted to mirror that. I've heard a lot of teachers say that they're just very, very apprehensive and don't think that enough planning is being done. Uh, we'll see from our local staff survey that there's a high level of anxiety. Um, even though most teachers have said it was, uh, let's see, 87.7% of those who filled out the survey said they are returning to work. Um, later, though, expressed a high level of anxiety about returning to work. Um, some it was for their own safety, and for some it was uh, for those that they care for. Um, they might have a significant um, other family member that they care for that um, is at high risk. So um, we definitely are seeing that here locally as well. Uh, so Jed, before we um, jump into uh, Jackie's little overview, would you want it? Um, kind of give the update on how we did uh, in Wapaka County over the weekend. It was not a good weekend for the county. Yeah, so like you said, not not a not a good weekend for us. Um, we we added just over the weekend 22 new cases. So um, and that's kind of been the trend we've been going the last three weeks. We've definitely been trending higher and amount of cases that we're seeing new cases on a daily on a daily uh basis um and every time we have you know new cases we also have new contacts so um we've we certainly been busy with our public health staff with just following up on with individual uh confirmed cases and contacts so we're right now we have 61 active cases we have 116 recovered and that's uh, along with 12 deaths. We did um, last last week report an additional death. So that's a, a total of 189 positive cases um, overall. Now we've been trending, as I mentioned, um, not in the, not in the best direction right now. You know, consistent with obviously nationally, I'm sure you're all aware of how things are going um, in some of the southern states and around the country. Statewide, you know, we haven't been trending um, well either. We've been increasing number of cases and the percentage of positive cases has been tre trending in a higher percentage. It did dip a little bit today compared to the weekend. Um, but right now we're, if I if you do a seven day um, average, we're averaging six and a half new cases a day. Whereas last week it was four and a half and the week before it was two and a half. So we continue to kind of trend in the, definitely in the wrong direction. So. You know, not really good news, and you know we we certainly don't want to continue that trend getting up into school because that's you know that's gonna you know definitely influence some of the decisions that we're gonna have to make as we get closer to when school starts. So um, you know we're we're trying to do our best um, public health wise to continue to to inform people to you know provide the best education we can, provide the best guidance we can. Um, I think another piece of that too is with the the more cases we've you know we've had some outbreaks that we're we're investigating this. Most most of them are smaller um, outbreaks, but um, you know they you know they've all led to some. Basically, most of them are leading to behaviors that you know you hear the same thing nationally and statewide. Some of the behaviors that lead to to cases and outbreaks, and that's you know gatherings gatherings indoors in particular. Um, that's that's kind of some of the things that are leading to us trending in the wrong direction. So pretty, I mean, kind of consistent with what you're hearing statewide and nationally that we're kind of seeing the same thing. Okay. Um, so earlier, Amy had expressed that um, students not wearing masks, and I I know you had talked with the superintendents that um, you have, you know heard some people asking you about um, pushing for a mask requirement in the county. Um, do you want to say anything about, there are a lot of political pressures. We all understand that, so. Yeah, so, you know, there's definitely been some interest and some some push and some suggestions for having a, a county-wide mandate on face coverings. 
Um, you know, and I'm not going to rule that out as a, a consideration, but it's, it's definitely um, a tricky a tricky piece to navigate around because, you know, polit politically, mass have been kind of kind of been on the forefront. Um, enforcement is also a, a very difficult piece when you have that type of mandate. Um, you know, and, and people kind of are still seeing this as a and have different opinions on, on how how the overall pandemic um, you know is actually playing out and, and what it means. So it's definitely um, a difficult as as everything has been with this is, is a difficult challenge on on what are the best steps to 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 put in place and what are the best um, you know things we can do as a as a county um, to try to mitigate the situation. You know, um, I think that it's going to take some support, um, uh, you know, from partners and and from other areas, from county officials, to uh, to really to go in that direction. Um, I'm hopeful that we that we don't. I, I think if I think people can um, kind of take the information that we're seeing now as far as cases and. Um, you know, you've probably heard and seen some businesses have had to close. Um, so and we're going to continue to push um, a campaign out as far as wearing um, face masks and face coverings to help mitigate the situation, educate on what that means, um, you know, how they work. Um, but it, it is a, it's kind of a challenge um, to, to try to put something like that in the mandate um, just because of the way some you know, some things have gone before as well. Um, you are in a little bit. Wait for me. Um, Dane County did did implement yeah, a face covering uh, mandate. Milwaukee's looking into it. Um, um, those are the two that I know of. Maybe I think a few other counties have had conversations about it, but I haven't heard anything in place um, anywhere else. So, you know, like I said, something that there could still be potential for it, but right now that's that's not where we're at for a so number of reasons. So you're hopeful that through education, people will choose to be cautious and use the social distancing or masks where it's appropriate um, rather than having to mandate it, um, that people will just understand how important and valuable it can be for helping other people. And I would Can say I too, ask I a quick? There, I'll, I'll just just quick. I think I am seeing some some signs that that is happening. I, just my wife, for example. I mean, she, she goes. She went to the grocery store this weekend and said like seventy percent of people were wearing masks in there. Where the week before, like hardly anybody was. So um, I'm hopeful that that kind of understanding and trend continues. Um, you know, we're you know we're seeing some of the results of. Like I said, behaviors um, that are kind of resulting in the, the way we're trying right now. A quick question as far as you talking about the case numbers are going up, but in reviewing the hospitalization numbers and death numbers, they are going down dramatically. Isn't that correct? Uh, they've been they've been steady. They have been going down for quite some time, and then they've they've been pretty steady. Like I said, we, I think last week we we talk to our healthcare providers every week, and we get status updates from them. And you can also look on the uh, associate Wisconsin Association of, of Hospitals, and they provide data. The thing we have to kind of pay attention to, and what you're seeing from some of the other states, is that lag. There's a lag um, typically with hospitalizations and fatalities. So. So far, so good. I think that's been a bit of good news that uh, you know we haven't seen increases in hospitalizations um, and ICUs, but there is usually that lag. So hopefully that that trend continues. So we, at this point in time, there is no direct correlation as far as increase in cases, increasing uh, saying that there's an increase in the severity of the illness. To this point, from our numbers within the county, we haven't seen it yet. But like, like I said, there's usually a tip. There's a lag. So if you looked on the on the Wisconsin Health Association website today, with their, yes, they, they, they there's been a bit of uptick there um, statewide. 
and regionally. I think they, they'll break it down by region on that website. The, the Fox Valley region um, is what we're included in, and their ICU um, beds have, they've lessened the amount of ICU beds, the lessened the amount of patients um, and everything over the last uh, several days. And it's been, um, you know, a downward trend and everything. So I think when we talk about an uptick in cases, we have to talk about the whole picture as to that they're, you know, they're, and again, as you said, there's a lag, but you also have to be talking about, you know, we're not seeing, you know, X as the severity because that would, you know, um, be a definite indication that there's something to worry about um, as far as a severity situation. If it's more a thing of we've got positives and people are asymptomatic and everything, um, you know, that's a different approach to I'd like our to add a word nope. or two here when you're that, ready. I think okay. That absolutely figures into it, but I think you also have to pay attention to what's going on elsewhere that are having the, the same sort of trends. Cases um, are going higher in some of the other states, so are hospitalizations, ICUs, and deaths. So we, we can't we can't ignore what else is happening around the country. Um, Nurse Jackie, I know you were um, hoping to say a few words and then maybe you can segue into um, describing how you would envision health visits to look in the fall. Um, yeah, I, I'm doing, Jen, I'm doing with the Winnebago County. I've joined their, their group with, and yes, the, the numbers have been really jumping in the past few days after the holiday weekend. and. Yeah, Going with the trend like we thought, it has been the younger groups, with which ends up with a lot, many more contacts. And reasons people get tested for the most part is they are symptomatic. Yes, there are the asymptomatic ones, but uh, many of the asymptomatic ones are ones that have never been tested. And, and you, you'll find out later that uh, they might have been positive. We're going to see how that pans out in the future weeks, and we're preparing, as we've seen in other states, how that filters out when you have a young group of people, many that are positive, and they they don't they don't see the real need for social distancing because there's a smaller percentage of them who get it really bad uh, as they continue to mingle like we said we're seeing so many contacts within this group um, what that what will happen because we've seen it get really bad weeks following not only those individuals as they continue to get more sick but as they come in contact with their family members their parents their parents parents uh, and and young ones too so we'll, we'll see how it goes um, um, Nurse Jack, one of the questions was about um, children with asthma. Asthma. And, I saw that and, one. And the wearing of masks. And then maybe if you want to talk about the health room visits, as long as the floor is yours for a moment. Sure. Brian, can I share? Yep. I'll stop sharing and it's all yours. Awesome. Okay. I'll present a window here, see what they get. Okay. So as a group, nurses in the whole, Wisconsin's chopped up into 12 different districts. So we're in the sixth district and, and we meet pretty frequently because things that are happening, like you said, we're part of the Fox Valley type area and all the surrounding areas, what we're seeing. Um, and when we wanna make policies, what are we seeing here? So I wanted to go back down to the bottom. One of the things we discussed was a webinar on the allergy and asthma for one of the groups on uh, what we're going to be seeing in schools in the fall. Um, they said that despite, depending upon we're using the cloth face masks, especially with the way the schools are planning to use them, which I'll get into later, there shouldn't be any concern with allergy asthma. Um, if an individual is having a problem with it, uh, we'll address it then, but no, in general, that will not cause a problem. The big thing with allergy and asthma is looking at those people need to use nebulizers uh, sometimes. And the individuals that do, uh, most schools have chosen to have them do that at home. Typically, we'd have them do that in the health room, but since nebulizing can aerosolize and, and make that virus then, you know, inhale breathing, not to have them do that at school, students that need that will either need to stay home or go home to administer their treatment. The other concern, and we need to talk to students that carry their own inhalers, Again, what you're doing with the inhaler, making sure you're walking away and using it because many students just use their inhaler wherever they happen to be. You know, they should kind of walk off and seclude themselves from a group before administering their inhaler. So does that help answer that question on inhaler or uh, asthma? 
whoever asked that, let's see who was asking. That was one of our parents, Ashley. Does uh, any other question about that, Ashley? Okay, then we'll go up to some of the things looking at schools and when we make our plans, we like to make plans that's following to make a coordinated effort effort from what other schools are doing in our district and across the state. It makes adhering to these much easier um, when we all have that united front and um, you know most things are guidelines. We are we are encouraging people to do the best they can, and then some things we have to be pretty pretty strict on. So looking at a sample of a reopening, which this is. Could you make it a little bit larger? It's a little hard to see what you're doing. Sure. Can you, is that better? Yeah, yeah. that's okay. better. All right. So we have our health screening guidelines that may or may not be what our school is going to choose to do, but this is what many are doing. The 100.4, some are going with 100.0, some are doing 100.4. We use the standardized 100.4 because that's what the CDC just suggests. Remember, we are a public school district. We need to follow, you know, follow what the CDC, Department of Public Health, and DPI uh, instruct us to do. Even though these are guidelines, we need to adhere to them as best we can. Going forward, when there's guidelines of students that become sick at school, we have an isolation room. Um, when students would come in to the health room, they would only be coming down as the teacher notifies us that they're coming. So we would get, need to be prepared. Um, children will be provided a face mask or covered wear in the isolation room if they did came down without one. We know they're supposed to be wearing face masks. Uh, some schools are making their things, um, choosing to have kids wear their face masks as they're coming in and walking in hallways. But once they're with their cohort group that they're going to stay with, then they can, especially at the elementary level, remove the mask in the classroom um, because regardless one way or the other, if someone was positive in the classroom, that whole classroom would then be contacts regardless of if they were wearing a mask or not. Uh, so that might be the thought process behind that one. But you still want the teachers, the people who are up front to be separate and we're still going to continue to do that. Anyway, parents and guardians would be contacted properly to pick up their child if they are sick and may not return to school until the above illness criteria are met. Now those criteria um, is that the parents should call their primary care provider for further directions or recommendations uh, to decide just because we have this going on doesn't mean we don't still have strep, hand, foot, and mouth, the flu. Uh, these things may still go on. And your physician is going to say, you know what? You've had a history of strep. Why don't we have you come in the office? And that ends up being the case. Um, many schools are requiring students to have a physician note upon return with at least 72 hours before they return to school. That is up to the district and, and looking at the providers and what we have available. I mean, that is putting a heavy burden on your physicians. Uh, are they prepared for that? Uh, not many schools have a fully fledged and fleshed out plan for what they're going to do. These are just the prepared ones they have. Guidelines, we have guidelines for staff, guidelines for cleaning and disinfectant, guidelines for travel. When we look at classes, things that are going to go into our thought process, are masks going to be worn to and from walking to school? And are they going to be needed or not needed in the cohort classroom? Are we doing cohort classrooms at the middle school and high school? Um, there's only a couple schools that are, are not planning on coming back currently um, with most of the student body. Um, he, but despite the recommendations, we all have to get everybody on board to do it. And everybody has to try and comply. Um, how are we going to do cleaning process between classes? Will it be students or teachers moving between the classrooms, especially if we do cohort groups? Um, and who will be cleaning classrooms between students if there is a passing time or if someone goes to the health room. Um, so, but most if they're having a fever will be going home for 72 hours before returning to school. Again, this is still not, this is our thought process, still not a flushed out plan. Some are requiring a physician note for re-entry and others are stating without a note, they will need to quarantine for 14 days. I, I don't know if, if we would want to adopt that, we'll, we'll see. Um, 
talking about face masks are, are I know we have been donated face masks, how many, uh, the washing process, even schools we've talked about, if they are doing the process of taking care of the masks and washing them at school, the thought process to do so is because you're concerned they may not get brought back or they may not get washed at home. And they will be reusing the same mask day in and day out. Um, Again, we're still kind of working through that process. What do we want to do? Do we have enough to have them um, bring in a new, bring in their old mask from previous day or leave them on their way out? And if they're doing that, what are they walking out the door with? The new mask, if as they're walking out to the bus and, and sitting on a bus and, and even distancing on the bus, you're supposed to be wearing the mask. Um, then they're looking at band. You know, what are we going to do for those incoming students that are starting brand that need to trial their instruments? Um, maybe hold the trials outside, um, stretching out the trialing for those instruments. Do you know what I'm talking about when the trial of new instruments? Usually it's either the is it fifth grade or sixth grade when they start band and they're looking at instrument. Okay. Um, one of our nurses reminded us it's the piccolo and the flute that they were told by their instructors that are the most concerned because they're doing the blow over to use that. Um, so they are the instruments that are most at risk. And uh, although one was saying there is a filter that we could use for the flute, I haven't even looked at that, if that's a possibility. Um, but that's about all I have. Does anyone have questions? I, I have a quick question as far as your um, taking temperatures. What's the calibration process for your thermometers? And um, who will be keeping those records? If you're going to be taking and sending somebody home based on a on a gauge and uh, and everything and making a decision, I'd like to understand what the measurement system error is. Is if it's off, you know, by plus or minus one degree, you could be sending people home for really no reason um, based on your threshold of your 104. Um, we can only work with what we're given. We've been given the guidelines. There currently, we'd have to create a guideline for that because there is no guideline for testing the thermometers. The thermometers, yeah, that actually, thermometers can be based on NIST qualifications. Um, National Institute for Standards and Technology would have a process and it would need to be traceable back to NIST and everything. There are calibration practices out there um, and everything. Um, if I can, if I can do them for making sure your brake assembly is okay, I'm pretty sure you can do them for a, a, you know, getting somebody's temperature. So they are out there. It just takes some work to figure out where to go. AST when we then are out there too. When we follow, and I encourage staff to do this, the things that we have to follow are, you know, OSHA, CDC, right. DPI, uh, and even in Department of Public Health, and even when we're looking at the other things, say you're looking at the American Medical Association, that is still yes. somewhat opinion-based, and, and we can't, I mean, we can adopt that, but it's kind of iffy. Uh, the reason we follow those, we are public schools, we get our funding through that, and those are the guidelines we follow. Now, the NISC, which please forward this to us. I mean, I would be happy to look into it. doesn't mean we can't adopt the extra, but it, again, I have to look at it and make sure that Despite the fact that this is a reputable organization, it still may not be something that we could or should adopt. I mean, it goes it goes to being able to have a repeatable grid, no matter who is using it, that there is a procedure that it's, we know that the gauge is good when we go to take those temperatures and everything. Because again, if you're gonna, you know, send somebody home and require them to, you know, basically go to the doctor, it should be accurate information. If your thermometer ends up being off by one degree and that puts you over the 104, you, you're, you're really sending someone home for really no reason if it's just a temperature situation. Okay. That is true. One of the things though is when you do have a temperature, you don't just take one. You do let the students sit for a little bit. I mean, maybe they'd have been outside and moving sure. around and their temperatures up. Maybe they came in from outside with a heavy coat on and they were sitting kind of in a spot blocked by and they're they're overheated. So you do wait, you don't just take it on the one temperature. Additionally, there is 
if we're doing the no touch thermometers, there is none that are accurate enough for you to say, oh yeah, they're always correct. Um, those are an iffy thing and we're aware and that is why a repeated test um, is good. And that's why we encourage parents too to take the temperatures at home with a regular oral thermometer, which has better accuracy before they send their students to school. Well, and, and again, if you understand the measurement system error, that it's off by plus or minus two degrees on a consistent basis, you then, you know, based on the reading that you get, you know where it falls. Is it within the plus or minus, you know, of, of the standard error of the measurement system, or is it over and above that? Those are just some things, again, there's going to be some pushback from parents. It's like, well, you know, you said their temperature was X. I got them an hour later and their temperature was something way completely different uh, and everything. So if we're strong in what we know and we're confident in our measurements and our data and we know that everybody's taking it the same and that we have some type of procedure, we double check it every morning to ensure that, hey, we get this type of reading, we should be good to go. You're going to have better buy-in from some of the parents. I will take that into consideration, but I will tell you the most often checked things as our, our diabetic monitor, um, machines where we're checking blood sugars, and even those are only checked once every three months. I mean, the procedure for that, to do that every morning, would put a, a big weight on. I will look into it, so please forward the information to me. But again, we follow the information that we have to, and we're going to provide that unified front. What are the other schools doing? Um, so I'll well, do the best, and I will look into it, and I will certainly present it to our other nurse groups. But we'll we'll see what comes of that, and I will follow up with you afterwards what results we have. So okay. please you know, forward that to Dr. Opper, and then she can forward that to me. Okay. So I will look into that. That's a good thought. I think anybody we're else a little nitpicky questions? on that, though. I mean, I work for Athetic Care, and there's. 7,000 people who have to take their temperature every single day and they don't ask us to calibrate our, our thermometers. They're trusting no. us. So I think, you know, there has to be some degree of, you know, taking the average, taking it three times, but also, you know, not focusing on some of these little tiny details. Otherwise we'll be here forever. Well, and, and you have to see what the recommendations are and, and I will look into it. I don't see any other district doing this and I'll bring it up to see what the thoughts are, but is that a reasonable thing to do? We'll see. Yeah. Any other questions, concerns? Any questions from our staff members who are on about um, health visits and kind of the process and when you'll send kids down to the health room? Okay. So we'll continue to flesh that out and I'll, I'll get something more detailed. I'll keep adding details into the slideshow. Um, so in terms of our staff survey, I, I did reference that just briefly that 87.7% .7 of the staff um, indicate that they would plan to return to work and that's out of 49 responses. So um, that's probably, um, Overall total staff, probably about 60% of the staff reporting in. And again, this is a, you know, it's voluntary on their part. It, it just helps to inform our thinking if we know what our staff is thinking. Um, and I'm not sharing that with you because of confidentiality as, as we promised. Um, the surveys were not anonymous because that allows us um, here at school, the administrators to be able to reach out to our staff um, but we did guarantee that there would be privacy in that process. Um, but as we got to the comment section at the end, uh, where people opened up kind of um, more broadly around some of the questions that we asked, um, there is a high degree of anxiety about returning. Um, so uh, Jed had talked this morning a little bit, um, explaining some of the science about what we know that um, in terms of the number of young people under the age of 12 that have actually um, been positive for COVID or are asymptomatic carriers, um, 
while we're always concerned about every single child, one sick child would be concerning to me, but um, a greater concern is uh, our staff. Um, we can't have 300 kids in, in each of the buildings and not have the proper number of adults to um, provide instruction and appropriate supervision of the kids. Um, and there is a high degree of anxiety among the staff members. So um, more than half of them expressed um, some type of concern for, for either their own well-being or that of uh, people in their home that they're responsible for. Um, so I, that's kind of where the mask conversation went a bit earlier today when we were talking with the superintendents was um, wearing masks um, wouldn't necessarily be for the kids or just for the kids. It would be to protect the, the well-being of their teachers um, and other staff in the building. So um, that was part of the conversation. Would people be willing to do it if it meant that they, it was a show of respect and care for their teacher? Um, so just putting that out there. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts or reflections on on that. I'm getting better at this wait time when we're having silence, but it's still awkward. <laughs> So um, going on to the next section then, um, parental choice is the direction we want to go in. Um, I'm not sure if we'll wait till registration day or if we'll try to ask parents sooner. Um, but the plan that we wrote um, is for the in-person option of instruction, uh, but would also offer synchronous and blended. So in-person would be the 4K through eighth graders basically be in, in cohort groups. So for the most part, they stay um, together as a unit um, with a few rare exceptions in middle school. High school, Dan was talking more about staggering um, passing times to not have so many people in the hallway at any given time. Um, synchronous uh, is what Bryant was talking about last time, getting cameras and microphones in classrooms so that those kids who are not able to be in school in person for whatever reason, either by parent choice or because they're medically fragile, uh, would be able to be live and connected with their teacher in their classroom in real time. So that's synchronous. So that camera's on, the teacher's in the front teaching, and students can see that happening live and be part of conversations and things of that sort. And then the blended format would be, um, those lessons would be recorded. Um, so let's say we have an ill child that um, needs to take rest periods throughout the day. Um, they would be able to watch the recorded lesson as they're able and, um, pace their day or pace their, their learning time um, as they're able to do so. Or for kids that just would like to see a repeat of the lesson, maybe it helps them to see it more than one time to help them learn new things. So that's something that um, principals would be working with families to find out uh, what their thoughts are. Through the informal survey, we got a little bit of feedback, but we, again, we didn't hear from everybody. We heard from roughly a third of our total population. So this would actually be asking parents, each parent specifically, what they would like to do this fall. Dan or Danny, any, any thoughts, comments, reactions on that? No, I, I think we're, we're preparing. I was going to comment with uh, Jackie's parameter questions about cohorts just so for 
where we're planning and where we're heading. Um, you know, as far as we'll see it in the slideshow. So I don't know if I wait till the slideshow comes up. Or were you planning on going through each one, Melanie, where we're at, or should I talk at a higher level regarding my plan? Um, we sure could go through the slideshow. I was many of the slides are the same, but I um, definitely could do that. So bring up plan, your part. Uh, that's all right. Um, I kind of divided my two slides and I think Danny did the same. Um, basically looking at safety precautions as well as education. Uh, as far as, let me find the slide, I'll get to it as well. <clears throat> Whoops, so, I have to do one more button, sorry. No problem. So as, as we're looking at uh, our KPI buckets, which is kind of how we quantify everything we do in the district, um, I divided mine into both learning uh, at the middle school as well as a safe and orderly environment. So the overall high level plan right now for returning to school, Manuel Middle School students would report directly upon entering the building to their middle school suite and their first hour class. Uh, students would attend class in cohorts for core classes with the classroom teacher. Live synchronous lessons, as Dr. Opper had mentioned, as an option for students not able to uh, attend in-person school with lessons also recorded. And the RTI will be based on student need with the rotation of core teachers coming to the classrooms. I did speak to every um, middle school principal and did get confirmation from everywhere from Marion, Iola, New London, Wapaka, um, Clintonville, and if we are in a, a, a middle school situation where students need to travel to their specials teachers, that is happening in all of the schools, at least that is their high level plan at this time. Uh, there are some specifics regarding band and choir that I still need to tweak out because uh, as I calculate square footage for the entire school divided by 36 square feet is what is recommended for kind of cubic feet for, for a child. Uh, we are almost spot on if everybody were to attend. Um, so we are we are bulging in the sixth grade a little bit. Um, we are I still need to tweak out two blended learning classes, not blended learning classes, but where there's eighth grade and ninth grade students uh, taking the class together in a health phi ed situation. We're looking at trying to split them up uh, and do some synchronous learning where the teacher would be uh, in class in one area perhaps, or using a larger venue such as the commons where we could spread uh, the students out to maintain that six foot distancing. Also a, an eighth and ninth grade algebra situation where I think it will have a, a teacher doing a synchronous lesson um, in the high school and the middle school students in that class would be synchronously learning. Um, so, so that's the learning portion as, as where I'm looking. Um, safe and orderly environment uh, for the Manuel Middle School, which is the next slide. Uh, again, the reporting directly to the first hour class. Students will travel to specials, but um, we are going to separate them from commingling with the high school with a staggered bell schedule. We will be doing physical distancing of student desks. Uh, science lab classes are going to incorporate the concept of dress like a scientist and goggles and masks will be required for labs as they move around the room. Um, disinfecting protocol is going to be embedded into classroom protocols and during passing times. Hand sanitizer will be available in all classrooms and learning spaces. The lockers are not planning on being uh, used at this time. I know that was a, a concern for some community members um, as to whether or not that, that is a safe choice. Uh, we're going up with the current research and as well as what everyone else in WPAC is looking at doing. And we're going to look at a staggered dismissal at the end of the day. Uh, that still has to be tweaked, but uh, so that way we don't have everybody doors barred wide open and off we all go. And lunch is being delivered to the classrooms. Uh, we've embedded a uh, an hour long period that's going to have a 30 minute lunch period and a 30 minute study session where staff will be able to supervise uh, one of those two periods so they can get a 30 minute duty free lunch. 
that was the best way for us to be able to do that. And what that ended up doing was just trimming four instructional minutes from each of the seven periods. I'll pause for a moment to see if there's any questions regarding those two KPI buckets for the middle school. I guess my question on the staggered dismissal, I understand the not everybody congregating and in mass leaving. Um, how will that staggering affect the buses, uh, both on coming in and going out? Um, two questions. I see one come up for Tracy. I'm, I do need to work with with uh, Mr. Elsner, and I this was added uh, since our last meeting, so I do need to contact him. I'm thinking that the staggered at most, it, it might add a few minutes before the actual departure of the buses. I don't have that completely worked out yet, Sonia. Is your concern that the delay would be, it, it wouldn't increase time on the bus, it would just increase the time to get to the bus and probably delay their arrival home is what you're saying. I, I, yeah, I guess I, you know, I mean, they've been already sitting very patiently in their seats the entire day. And, you know, when that release is going, there's going to be a little bit of chaos and I want to get out of there. And yes, it's already a situation where it takes some of them, you know, quite a bit of time to get home after school and everything. So, you know, not having to lengthen that out any significant amount would probably work out well for the timing of parents who are trying to understand, do I need to have somebody cover in order to get home or not? I think, um, I think if I hear you correctly, um, the last period of the day, and this is an advantage the way our bell schedule is set up, is that our response to intervention time with uh, remediation, as that will be very important, um, is not the primary instruction that they would be leaving. So being a remediation period, we could do it on either end of the of the bell. We either dip into our instructional time of, of our secondary and we release them closer to the dismissal time or we delay and go on the other end. So I, I think that's something that we have the flexibility yet to discuss as a staff and try to get some continued parental input on. And I, I think we can make either one of those happen. I think they're also going to get pretty good at it. I, I would anticipate, especially at the elementary, those first few days of calling a bus and it, those first few days are always a little slow and awkward, but once the kids get into the routine, you know, things move along quite well. Um, so I think we can become more efficient at it as we practice. Right. Routines are going to be important. Uh, the movement within the core classes, uh, Ms. Breaker, um, we're looking at keeping those cohorts there and then having the teachers rotate. So as far as what that looks like, are you asking, is it a cart or do I, do I go from sixth grade math to seventh grade math? What is, we would follow our normal bell schedule, but we would have the teachers move to the next class that they are teaching. Right. That was part of it. And the other part would be like, you know, I mean, getting up to get a Kleenex, getting up to sharpen a pencil, getting up to use the hand sanitizer, getting up and moving here, moving there, you know, and, and obviously we're all, it's intrinsic within us as teachers and educators. If a kid raises their hand, you know, I worry that about myself getting within that six foot distance because somebody raises their hand, I want to be right there to help them. Right. You know, and especially in math where we're looking at stuff, we're writing it down and we're doing it together right on the same desk. And I, how do I do that to continue to keep that safe distance of six feet? And, and you know, what do I need for the kids to do to know, you know, here's when you can sharpen a pencil or here's when you can do this or that. So that's the other part of the movement within the classroom. I see. We might have to strategize on some things, but I was looking at the CESA model for adult education, and um, they have one bin with the clean markers for people going up to the chart paper, and once the user uses it, um, it goes into a different bin, and it's wiped down or sprayed before it goes back into the, the clean side again. So I'm thinking there's going to be a can of sharpened pencils 
when they don't get up to sharpen a pencil, you'll just uh, swing by and drop off a sharp one. Um, and, you know, overnight, um, by some miracle, there will be sharp pencils in the can again for the next day. Um, I, I don't know. It may become a job for, for some of our students with special needs who do jobs as long as we can sanitize um, sanitize them. And, but maybe that's something they can do is sharpen pencils and drop them off, uh, you know, so you can grab a handful and have those ready for kids. But those are the kinds of things we have to talk about because we really want to minimize movement um unstructured movement and we want to minimize what um the shared touching of items although the research continues to tell us the highest rate of transmission is particulates in the air or aerosolized as um, nurse jackie talked about or person to person and that means being near the person less than six feet for 15 minutes. Um, so we have to be really sensitive of, you know, we we have to get in, do the job and not linger, which I know you you have a more, you know, sensitive touch, but we're, we're probably going to have to get in and get out. Um, we're we're going to be faced with <laughs> teaching procedures the same way that we did the, f the very first days of school when we're in anyway. Uh, it's it's going to be a matter of, all right, what, what does school look like this year? Here, here if, you need, if you need a Kleenex, if you need to go to the bathroom, and those are the things that we're going to have to work out with those kids as, as far as entering the school, exiting the school. All of those are repetitive procedures that we can reinforce and practice um, along with building those relationships. That's, we're going to be asked to do a lot of things, and we're going to have to just, I think, be able to find that balance but safety is always going to be the first so you know those are the procedures that that we'll be going over with um and we may be embedding you know some of the cleaning procedures right into our classroom i, I envision that you know certainly with some of the older kids that uh, a lot of this the wiping down of, of surfaces and those types of things those are responsible things that we can be teaching our kids i think that those are protocols that will work in any environment um, moving forward, the high school is not dramatically different than the middle school. They're still going to report to their first hour class, synchronous learning. Um, we know that we have RTI based on student needs and fourth quarter incompletes. Uh, we'll have RTI until the required standards have been met and utilization of the flipped classroom technique to provide op optimal utilization of time for students learning in class and virtually. Um, Safe and orderly environment, again, not anything dramatically different. The biggest thing that uh, will come as a, an adjustment is that we are going to be going with a closed campus that I don't believe I added on there yet for lunch times. is that um, all students will have to eat in the classroom, and this is going to be monitored based off of the Wapaka County risk level, um, that if the risk level ends up going to a very low level, we can look at um, opportunities for kids to once again leave school for lunch with uh, a protocol of cleaning and, and disinfecting and checking in through the school again. But um, according to both Wapaka County and CDC, we are looking to try to minimize um, opportunities for students to bring additional COVID back into the school. So Danny, I, I talked a lot. Did you want to go with anything for uh, elementary school? So there has been any really huge um, changes since last since we met last week. I believe I talked to you guys a little bit about last week. Some of the big things that I'm working through right now um, are the lunch in the classroom and the staggered recesses and play areas. Um, what we're doing is we have to figure out exactly how I, we have a schedule for how we can get the lunches all in the classrooms and have enough time in between for the kitchen to be able to do all of that. Um, but we have to figure out exactly how it looks between the kitchen and um, the classroom. 
So we're working on that at the moment. The recesses, we all, again, I have the schedule all laid out. I presented it to the teachers last week. I haven't heard any, um, that they've had any big issues with how the schedule works yet. The big thing is gonna be um, making sure that we're not cross-contaminating with playground equipment. So we're working right now with the staff to get grant money or try to find or rearrange funding to figure out how we can um, get each classroom to have playground like balls and jump ropes and all the things that you use on the playground um, for classes so that we, they don't have to share, but everybody has stuff. Um, we're working on painting on the blacktop, some blacktop games, because that would be part of, we're working on buying um, basketball hoops, because we don't have any basketball hoops out there right now. It's actually part of a larger project of, we just need to revitalize our whole playground because it's sad and we want better for, for our kids. And so we're working on that, um, working on scheduling disinfecting. Right now we are looking at 4K in early childhood to be the morning and afternoon sessions. We believe that that's the best for our students and working on um, assigning other staff members to be able to help with the disinfecting because the teachers don't have a lot of time in between sessions with their lunch um, and being able to set up for the next next session. Um, I think those are the big, and then talking to the teachers about um, videoing their lessons. How does that look at the elementary school? Because that's one of our big questions, um, how we can get that done so that it's really good instruction in the classroom for the kids that are there and really good instruction for the kids that are remote. Any questions for the elementary school? So Danny, you did address physical activity a little bit. Um, would you wanna say just a bit more about um, how how you would work um, physical activity or just movement for the young child into the routine of the day because that we know that's really important and I think that's something that some parents are a bit concerned about. Right. So we've always um, like movement is part of an elementary teacher's day, like their schedule. It's kind of innate with them. Kids usually move from the carpet to their desk or table and back to the carpet and around the room. So because we have to minimize that, we are not having our carpets, our carpet for carpet time in the classrooms in order for us to move the desks far enough apart. Um, but we will have, we always use Go Noodle. Go Noodle is the go-to for our elementary teachers for movement breaks in the classroom. So we'll continue to use that. Teachers, we talk about what kinds of activities would be best to be done outside because reading um, some of the recommendations from DPI and the CDC, outside is the safest place um, for everyone just because of the air movement and that can keep us a little bit healthier. So we're working on um, what are the things, the science lends itself really nicely a lot of times because we're doing things with nature and outside. There's, a lot of tree and plant um, activities that we're doing. Um, and then just talking about how could we schedule time for students to be able to be outside at different times other than recess to be, but still learning. Um, we are having a one-way travel route throughout the school that can move. Um, there are gonna be times that FIAD class might be using the gym if the, she has time in between to make sure that everything gets sanitized um, and just the area we have some air movement um, and the particles can settle so there could be some time that they're going through walking through the building at least for that but we are trying to minimize that as much as we can um, so it's going to be a lot of in class kind of behind standing by your desk doing some of our movement breaks and getting outside are our big two. 
So is Go Noodle, is that like an online program that comes up on the screen and the kids mirror the activities they see? whatever movement is on the screen. Yes, they have some very goofy songs that kids really get a kick out of. It's like dance things and just movement breaks that are on the Promethean boards. It's also fun for adults if you're into it. And I would love to see Bryant do one. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, one of the things um, I know Janine was doing some research into it, and it's related to the slides, but we don't have a specific slide on it just yet, is social emotional learning. Um, but both schools have really been working, um, getting staff trained on being sensitive to social emotional learning and how important that is. Um, would anyone like to talk about um, your thinking about how to do that as we move forward? Well, I, I will since I've been um, mostly doing research and, and looking at different ways to um, implement this in looking at social and emotional learning. Um, they are skills and activities um, that teach um, self-management, um, emotion management, um, working with others, all of those good things that we like all of our students to have as they um, navigate through school. Um, but in terms of working with staff, there's really three main um, things that staff are um, needing to do in terms of working to build those relationships. Um, and that's having like consistent welcoming and inclusive type activities, um, and then engaging strategies like brain breaks and what to do during, you know, kind of transitions from topic to topic, and then looking at um, what social emotional learning calls optimistic closures. And that's not, it goes beyond like, hey, we had a great lesson today. Um, but like, you know, kind of asking kids and, and getting students to reflect on what they learned um, and share with others. And there's probably a whole lot more that goes into all this, but that's just kind of things in a nutshell that we're working on for staff. Um, and then trying to, I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, mindfulness, um, yoga practices, you know, doing some classroom type movement and stretching. Um, and all of that is good stuff and remains to be seen in terms of how we do that in a classroom um you know with social distancing and all of that stuff but um right now there's there's a lot of things happening at least in you know in both buildings but particularly um you know with our middle school students who are are you know coming to us um, and needing a lot of that kind of focus so Any questions for Janine? At the elementary level, one of, what we're really focusing now with the staff and our discussions is how do we create a sense of community in our in our building when we can't be together? Because that's very important at the elementary level is the um, assemblies and getting everybody together and getting excited that about school and that we're one building um in one one school community but it's hard to do that when you can't see each other and you know there's another classroom of second graders but you can't see them even though they might have been in your class last year so we're kind of we've been brainstorming some ideas of how to do that um a couple ideas are talking about doing um, morning announcements live from different classrooms. So being able, since all the teachers are gonna be um, videoing their classes, so could we do announcements and have everybody in the school be able to watch a classroom do it um, so that they can see different people around the school. Another thing is virtual assemblies. Again, having different grades and, and classrooms, kind of being in charge of different activities so that we can still be be together, but yet not be able to be in the same room. So kind of using our these virtual meetings that we 
the as teachers we've been having quite a bit and kind of expand that to students and bring everybody together. Uh, next on the agenda was emergency drills. I don't know that we have that all fleshed out yet because we're a little reliant there on uh, the expertise of some people in our community. Um, is that right, Dan and Danny? We need a little more time on that one. Yes, you are correct. Okay. All right, so we'll hold that for a future meeting. Um, Brian, you had put together a slide for us. Um, if you'd like to talk a little bit about um, what you put on the slide since last we met. Yeah, absolutely. There's just four main areas I wanted to cover um, with everybody here. First off is um, expanding access for all students to have more technology. Um, one thing we have that's great in this district is we're one to one for grades six to 12. Uh, for the younger grades, presently, we're sharing devices. Um, the more and more we think about the logistics of that for an elementary teacher, um, what that looks like, trying to have a cart full of um, Chromebooks that are shared between multiple classes, the more unreasonable that seems. Um, for example, kids can't go out to the cart to get their own devices. The teachers will have to go out there, get the devices, and clean them. Um, and there just isn't enough time to, to reasonably do that. Um, so. So we did find a way to, um, to grow our one one program for 4K through 12. So for grades um, 4K through two, so 4K one and two, uh, kindergarten one and two, those students are gonna have Chrome tablets. And then for grades five, uh, four, five, and six, they're gonna have their own Chromebooks. So instead of having a shared cart, we're gonna grow the program so we're able to have uh, everybody with one to one devices. We really think that if we're going to have a one-on-one -one program, it's the only real way to, to have that safely in this environment is that everybody has their own device. Um, we also expanded our hotspot, um, our, our call it Jeep program last year. Um, so I have about 30 of these wireless hotspots that we can share with families in the school district. Um, so the idea is if someone doesn't have internet, then we do the best we can to get them uh, internet access. We just don't want to allow people not to have internet. Um, if we Regardless if they're shut down or not, um, it's just that much more important to have internet access. Um, the next thing, um, so 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 those are trying to get technology, everybody who needs it. Um, the next thing is, um, I'm, I'm calling this outreach development, um, which for that is this, we're trying to better support our parents and guardians who are helping students at home. So trying to give them the support they need so that they can um, help uh, help with Chromebooks, help with access technology, and um, uh, use the platforms that we're using in our school district. So the teachers and students are using it. Um, we want the parents to have support uh, to help support their students out. Uh, and then also um, all the communication channels that we have. Um, so whether or not we're using Skylert, so you can get your text messages and phone calls automated, um, you know, access to all of our websites that we're using, access to whatever tools are available, um, we want to make sure that people know how to get that. Um, you want to be able to support the distance learning. So the teachers are being asked to do more uh, in the classroom. Uh, having to deal with students in classroom and at home uh, does make their job more difficult. So we want to try to provide more support for them, um, which means um, part of that is going to be more technology. So cameras and microphones and things to make it possible to do all this stuff at home but also um, giving them professional development to, um, to use these, these uh, different media um, um, platforms, right? So if, if we're asking them to record their videos, we want to make sure that they, they have the tools available and they have the support to know how to do that comfortably. Um, and as, as I said earlier, more, more teacher PD. So we want them to feel comfortable using the tools they have. Um, so the, those are the, the main um, uh, high level uh, portions of, of, of the plan for this fall. Um, so, uh, yes, I don't know if there's any questions with that right now. If you guys want to um, ask some questions about that, um, then um, we go for that. There's still a lot of personal development that's going to happen over the summer. 
uh, that's being rolled out, um, particularly with new systems to Seesaw. Um, but but that's uh, that, that's where we're going with this fall. I do have our sub caller calling substitute teachers to find out um, if they are intending to do on our sub list for the fall. Um, some of the other superintendents told me they're already getting calls to indicate that the, some of their substitutes are not returning because of COVID. And then um, secondly, if they would like to be included in our summer professional development um, so that they're in tune with um, the cameras, the microphones, the, the online learning things that we're using in, in typical classrooms. So they, they will feel confident and a part of things as they um, help us out throughout the school year. And, and for right now, we wanna focus on the Google platform, which is big in both buildings, Seesaw, which is new in the elementary school. And then there's a couple other tools that we're getting full licenses for, for the high school. Um, but we are also doing in the middle of a survey with the staff, and one of the questions is, what what do you need support with? Um, so we want to um, listen to what, to what the teachers are telling us and try to uh, offer that as well. So so the things that we're talking about covering now, we might augment that based on, on what the teachers tell us here very soon. I feel there should be more questions at this point. <laughs> Brian, is there, is there any like little checklist you could send out to some of us that, you know, might be a little bit more tech savvy where we could do a little bit of checking over or, you know, um, assessing um, the lap, you know, the Chromebooks and stuff that the kids currently have to maybe give you an idea what what's coming into you come this fall? Yeah, um, uh, actually, Dan and I were, uh, Wolfgram and I were talking about that earlier today. Um, yeah, we, we, we want to um, try to head off um, any defects uh, sooner rather than later. So we might ask people uh, if, if, if your Chromebook just doesn't work, then we might ask you to bring it in during registration um, or drop it off beforehand. That would give us uh, more of an opportunity to, um, to repair them. Um, uh, one of the like, kind of horror stories in our head is everybody shows up day one, we realize 15, 20% of the devices don't work, and then we get shut down day three, right? Um, I'm not that fast. So so um, th that's obviously the worst case scenario. So if we can, like what you said, um, and, and, and it, it's not even a text savvy thing, it's turn the Chromebook on, can you get to Google Classroom, does your camera work, does your microphone work? Like it, it's just a couple of real quick checklist things, but uh, yes, that, that, that is actually what I would put under the uh, outreach development, so providing like a video showing how to do a quick checklist, um, I think is something that's all worth doing. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, you know, at least be able to say what we're going to give back to you is, is in some semblance of working condition to at mm -hmm. least get them going the first couple of days. Yeah. And, and, and if it's not, um, knowing that is important because then we can, um, if, if I know that we're going to get slammed. I can have a stack of older Chromebooks that aren't that well, that good, but are serviceable to hold you over, um, and then we can go from there. Thank you, guys. And since last we talked, the other section that has been um, built out just a little bit more um, is the health-related section. Um, and again, uh, this is just first looks at things, but um, when students come to the health office, um, they're kind of, it, it'll be the initial screening of which thing are you here for? So you need your usual medication or it scrapes, bee stings, bruises, you know, th those things, they'll go to the traditional health room um, and get that taken care of following the usual protocols. Um, those that are coming in with COVID-like symptoms, fever or unexplained symptoms would move into the isolation room and be assessed um, separately. And then as appropriate, um, 
using the parent in emergency contact. Um, so I did include from almost everything I pulled out was from the CDC. So um, examples of what to look for in terms of COVID, a wide array of symptoms, um, not all of them explained by COVID. Some of these symptoms can be related to other types of illnesses. So we are aware of that. Um, I did put um, particularly related to kids when you would seek medical attention. Again, this came from uh, the school section under the CDC. Um, everywhere, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Everywhere where you see the blue, um, those are links to other areas. So again, the quarantine actually takes you to the CDC where it defines what a quarantine is and how that's different from isolation. And uh, when do you do it and why do you do it? Um, so um, again, these are the recommendations um, directly from the CDC. I didn't alter them. And protocol for re-entry, this also came from the CDC, but it, it is what Jed referenced last week when we talked, um, being free of fever for three days, and that's without having to take medications to, to cause a fever to come down. Uh, symptoms improving, and it's been 10 days since the symptoms first appeared. Or, again, um, as Nurse Jackie had mentioned, getting clearance from a physician. Whether And we did hear Dr. Geddard say that in his office, at least, um, it doesn't always mean the physician has to do that. Um, the nurse, um, his nurse, often will uh, be responsible for doing that as well, or having two negative tests in a row that are 24 hours apart. Um, and then uh, slightly different if you tested positive but didn't have symptoms. It's, it's similar, but um, obviously if you don't have symptoms, you don't have symptom improvement. Um, so from the staff survey, um, one of the comments was they just want to make sure that whatever protocols we have related to illness and return from illness, that everyone is consistent and that everyone follows them, that we don't make exceptions. Um, so that will be a, a really important thing that we, whatever we adopt, we do it with fidelity. Um, oh, and now we're back there. So those were some new slides that you had not seen last week. I have a, a question for Jed. Um, is there anything that you're hearing, Jed, that we are moving forward with that we are either going to have to pump the brakes or do an about face. Anything that's out of the norm, whether it be our, our movement, our learning, our protocols, things that are, are lining up with uh, your perspective of, of where we're going with other Wapaka County schools? No, I think um, I think everything that we've got um, in place right now is pretty much um, on par with you know what. Uh, what we'd be recommending and, and what I think most of the other districts are looking at. Thank you. Any other questions? And I am watching the chat box too. Nothing new there at the moment. I guess I, one of the concerns from several, I talked to four different families over the weekend and they range from elementary school through high school within the Manawa School District. And I, I, their biggest concern is that, you know, as, as a parent, they're saying, this is what I want for my child. And they're concerned that school officials will attempt to circumvent their wishes as far as their children are concerned. Um, so I think that that's a concern for probably a lot more 
um, parents and guardians as to this is what I want for my child, but the school is going to say something different and and um, work to circumvent by reward, shaming, whatever it might be um, to get them to do something different than what the parents want. So I think that as a group, um, you need to be, you know, maybe very straightforward and um, state, um, you know, how, how things would be handled when we're looking at what the parents' wishes are for their child. Are you saying that you feel as though, I, I don't mean to use these two terms, conservative, conservative versus liberal in, in any political way, but do they feel that maybe stringent, that the school is going to be more stringent than what they would, the environment that they would like their child to be in? No, I, I, I think it's okay. Um, we'll take mass just, just as, as an easy one to talk about and everything, if they're, if the parent says, my child will not wear a mask, that's their, that's their decision for their child. And I've, I've heard on this meeting a couple of times over the last couple of weeks, you know, about how about if we make a really good reward for the kids that wear it, so the kids that aren't wearing it will feel bad, so they'll want to wear them and everything. And that circumvents what the parent wants for the child and everything so I guess that's kind of where I'm leading it's not so much a liberal or conservative situation it's what the parent has deemed what they feel they want for their children one real world example would be um, weightlifting has already started um, they started July 1 um, it would be talking with the, the young men and women who are participating in that program to see if anything like that has occurred. To, um, I'm not, I don't believe that anyone's been treated poorly um, for their choice. Some wear them, some, some kids wear them, some don't. All the adults do wear them. Um, so that, that might be a good place to start. So they might have that internal fear but do we have any actual examples that that is occurring? And Danny, it looked like you might want to share something. Um, yeah, I. my only point to share is that I hope that families will be conscious of the fact that we are going to be put in a situation where we're going to have parents on both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between. That we are going to have families that are coming into our four walls that say, I don't want anybody to wear a mask. Um, and then we're going, we, we know based on the, um, the survey that there are families that are very afraid. They're afraid to send their students to school. They're afraid of getting the virus and everything in between. Um, so we really, it's on us to try to balance and make everyone as, as happy and as comfortable as we possibly can, which, and really at, at the end of the day, we're, our job is to keep everybody safe, to keep all of our staff safe and all of our students safe and teach, and teach them how to read and to write and to be very um, important citizens for our futures. So I just hope that everybody understands that it's nothing personal as far as we're concerned. We're just trying to keep everybody safe and to be able to run the district as well as we possibly can and do what we really believe. We don't want to hurt anybody or any child. And I, I, agree, I agree with that statement. It was, you know, again, if it's the parent's choice to have one thing or another that that there is a feeling that there will be un either there will be influence on their child to do the opposite of what the parent wants within the school setting and um and everything and that's just again something i'm just telling you that in the discussions i had with you know several of the parents and everything and they range from 
the elementary school through the high school that there is some concern that you know that once they're in school that the parents preferences their choices for their children uh, may be unduly circumvented throughout the day over a period of time i'm just telling you that that's the feeling okay so as a committee representative and and a person as a communicator out to our public are based on what you've heard here are you able to report back to those families that um they don't need to be concerned about that, that our family's wishes are not going to be disrespected. Well, I guess I would say no, because in our very first meeting, Dr. Gettertz made the comment towards the end of the meeting um, that maybe we should be, you know, greatly rewarding the kids that will wear masks and not recording, rewarding the kids that won't wear masks. So maybe we can get more of the kids to wear masks. To me, that is a clear indication within this meeting dialogue of someone saying we should circumvent in some way the parent's choice. So at, at that level, based on the first meeting, I would say no. So I, you know, from the school itself, you, it, there needs to be, you know, a, you know, someone saying, look, we're gonna take and do the best we can to work with your choices with your children as we go through this and and everything. And if your choice is that the kids wear a mask all the time, great. If it's that they don't wear a mask ever, fine. And we figure out how to make that work. I'm just telling you that there is a concern and based on what the doctor said in at the end of the very first meeting um, and everything, I would not say that, you know, as someone who is, um, assisting and you know um, giving advice to the committee that 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 was something that went along with the parents choice yeah although we don't see that anywhere in the plan nor have we discussed pursuing behavior of that type since because we we don't do shaming in school um, we have very strict bullying and harassment protocols especially um, Title IX was just reissued and it's even more stringent than it was in the past. So we are, I believe, super sensitive to um, respecting all our families. I just wanted everybody to be aware that those were, you know, some of the concerns and everything because, you know, through social media and various places, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of the shaming situation, you know, just again, going to the grocery store or not, uh, and that type of thing. Um, you know, so just so you're aware that that was some of the concerns of the parents. No, I, I fully respect it. And I've experienced it myself because I do wear a mask when I go out because I have to be cautious not to take anything back to people I care for. And um, I have been made fun of be, because I do wear a mask. So I I do hear what you're saying, and and I certainly do respect that point. I'm hoping, though, as a committee, that we can go out and communicate with folks that some of these worries that they have, um, that they don't need to worry about those things because that is not the direction that we're we're taking as a group. And and again, as long as we're you know making sure that we're spelling out you know all the key points out for the information that we're going to give to the parents, so that they can read it and have it in their hand, they'll feel a lot better. Well, that's actually a great segue into um, the next item on the agenda, which is the last item, and um, moving into brainstorming how to educate parents and getting our positive messaging out. Um, that would happen after the board meeting. Um, the board hasn't approved the plan yet. Um, they haven't actually even seen the plan yet, but I will be sharing, sharing it with them this week in my weekly update. Um, but brainstorming some ideas, um, how best to use this PowerPoint, how to get it out there in front of families. Um, what do you know about the, the ways that our folks get information or prefer to get information? Uh, 
I know that the school newsletter um, is something that a larger majority um, do read. Um, some of the emails get passed over um, if it's an email blurb and you need to open an attachment. Um, some of the some of the of the families that I know they they only really have their cell phone to be able to look at something. So looking at a presentation on a cell phone is probably not an easy way to do that. Um, but again, you know, and, and again, it you know, being able to open up a pre, you know a presentation and understand how that goes um, for some of our parents that aren't as tech savvy might be a little bit of a comp, you know, uh, a problem too. Can I suggest possibly like um, take the presentation and maybe do like a, a voiceover video, maybe something explaining it. That way they can see the presentation, but they can also hear kind of a narration of it. Um, might be something that'll work for people who are tech savvy or not. Yeah, I think I have a voice for radio. I was gonna. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna need Danny Bauer if uh, I think she loves doing that stuff. Bye, Jed. Thank you. That's a no. <laughs> unless... No, actually, I probably also have a, a face for radio, so <laughs> it would be that would probably be. I, I'm probably the most familiar with the presentation, uh, you know, components, so. Not that we couldn't have different people speaking about their own sections too, which we definitely could do. Um, Jacob, I, you had mentioned in an email that um, Cobason Safety Department and Safety Director were working on some things. Would you want to give just a brief update from last time? Yeah, so uh, our Safety Department is going to be working on a policy um, as to how we should clean our buses between the routes. Um, I'm not quite sure if it'll go into detail of if we have to space the kids out. Um, that I think we will mainly move up to the, each district. Um, so we'll be working with all the districts with that part of it. Um, but I believe mainly it's going to be about how to sanitize them properly. And we'll be doing that company wide. And um, like I said, each district's going to be a little different um, as to how everything's going to come out. Because um, there's some districts that have multiple schools where, like, we only have three schools to deal with. Um, so that it, everything is going to look a little different. Um, and that should be coming out hopefully by this week, Friday. Uh, but if I have it sooner, I will certainly share it with you once I get it. Um, and then I was told that we as a company are not going to have our drivers screen the students as they come on the bus. Um, that's, a, it's mainly because of, we would have to keep that information and we don't want our drivers to do that, um, based on the HIPAA, uh, HIPAA, HIPAA laws. <laughs> um, so we're not going to have our drivers do that. We're just going to have them stri strictly drive the bus. Um, and not only that, it would be a huge safety factor for them too. Uh, but uh, that's, that's all going to be coming out this week, and I will we'll share it with you once I get it. Any questions? So Jed hopped off, but he also did share this morning that um, the county is putting together a, a little screening guide for parents at home, just the kind of thing you might put on your refrigerator or kitchen counter. and before the kids go out the door, the things to think about, um, the questions to ask, and asking parents to to make sure their kids are healthy before they send them out to the bus or, or run out to the car to come to school. And I, I do believe all the county schools are gonna be using that as well. Okay.
Well, it looks like we're getting close to the finishing touches. Um, I've got emergency drills down for um, needing to be on the next meeting agenda. Is there anything else that you'd like to have on our final meeting before this goes to the board? Any gaps in the, the plan? Dr. Opper, I think you might have answered this already in a previous meeting, but I'm assuming that our plan comes with the caveat that things can change as as information dictates. Is that correct? <laughs> um, well, that was, I. there's a special, we call it the Judd slide. Um, <laughs> so um, there it is. There you go. So yeah, he he did ask that we just always put that into any of our plans because he said, again, um, if there was a really major uptick, we would have to, we may have to act quickly, much like happened in March where uh, we got very little notice about the closure from the state. So um, that could happen again. Hopefully it doesn't. So if it if it did, we do need to be prepared. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Now you can all affirm to Jed that his slide is in there. <laughs> Any other topics? And feel free as you're thinking about it during the course of the week, if you go back and look through um, as I continue to refine it, if you see that there's something missing that you know parents are talking about, uh, be sure to let me know and I can add it in. I don't want it to become too lengthy so that people lose interest and, and don't look at it or wouldn't listen to the little video voiceover, but, um, but I want it complete enough so that people feel confident that we've done our due diligence. So are we thinking that potentially a short meeting next Monday might do the trick? Um, any chance we could meet a, a tinge earlier? I don't know what, what everybody's day looks like. Um, Thanks, Amy. I'm glad you've got some time on your hands. Um, could we do maybe what a four o'clock meeting and and do one hour, four to five, and and try to have some closure? Okay. Next Monday, four to five. It is. And I will try to get an invite out to you and feel free to give me feedback on that slideshow. And I'll work with Bryant on, on um, starting to plan for getting a video voiceovers uh, so that we're, we're ready to get that out in a timely fashion following the board meeting. Any other questions or comments from anybody? Keep talking to the folks out there, find out what they're thinking, um, and as best you can, be that positive voice that we are doing the very best we can, and we will continue to do so. And thank all of you for your service. It's greatly appreciated. It's a huge commitment, I know, but um, I couldn't do this alone. I really appreciate your help. Good night, everybody.